uh, our image because we really have no allies uh, in the war in Iraq, and we need to focus on Afghanistan. Um, I also would like to see Tammy Duckworth, being that she's lost her limbs in Iraq, that she knows a lot about Veterans Affairs, and I would like to see her appointed as uh, for veterans. All right, thanks. Well, we'll see what happens with all these positions uh, in the weeks ahead, and then confirmation hearings will happen uh, on the Hill, and we thank everybody for calling in this morning. Washington Journal starts at 7 o'clock each day here on C-SPAN, so we'll see you back here tomorrow. And uh, we go to the Hill now for a hearing. It's the House Oversight and Government Reform Domestic Policy Subcommittee, chaired by Congressman Kucinich, Democrat from Ohio. Federal intervention in financial markets, the topic here. The key witness, Neil Kashkari. He is the Interim Assistant Secretary for Financial Stability. He is the man at Treasury that Secretary Paulson has put in charge of this $700 billion uh, intervention program that has made so much news in recent weeks after its enactment. Still making lots of news. They want to hear all about it today on the Hill. We'll be here live for the next few hours. Enjoy your day. this Friday morning coming to you live from the Rayburn House Office Building. On your screen, Elijah Cumming, Cummings, the uh, congressman from Maryland. He is a member of this House Oversight Subcommittee, the Policy Subcommittee. The hearing will be chaired by Dennis Kucinich of Ohio. This one, this particular hearing is looking at how the uh, Treasury Department is spending part of that $700 billion rescue plan. And the man leading that effort, Neil Kashkari, is among the witnesses. In fact, he will be the first witness up this morning. He is there. And we're waiting for the chairman and other members to arrive. In a uh, similar related story, the Associated Press reports this morning that a presidential panel is announcing steps to strengthen oversight of complex financial instruments partly blamed for the global financial crisis. The president's working group on financial markets is taking steps to bring more openness to the work murky world, the AP writes, of derivatives and credit default swaps. Looks like Chairman Kucinich is in the room and ready to gavel in. Live coverage here on C-SPAN. The Subcommittee on Domestic Policy of the Committee on Oversight and Government Reform is now in order. Today's hearing will examine the foreclosure crisis and its solutions.
Without objection, the Chair and the Ranking Minority Member will have five minutes to make opening statements, followed by opening statements not to exceed three minutes by any other member who seeks recognition. Without objection, members and witnesses may have five legislative days to submit a written statement or extraneous materials for the record. The title of this hearing is, Is Treasury Using Bailout Funds to Increase Foreclosure Prevention as Congress Intended? Two days ago, Secretary Paulson gave his answer, no. Secretary Paulson's policy reversal breaks with congressional intent, contradicts public assurances previously made by Treasury and leaves the Federal Government without an adequate mechanism to stem a tide of home foreclosures. Congress's intent in enacting the Emergency Economic Stabilization Act of 2008, the statute that created the Troubled Asset Relief Program, was in part to buy troubled mortgage assets and implement a plan to minimize risk for foreclosures. Only three weeks ago, Mr. Kashkari testified before the Senate that he was preparing to purchase troubled mortgage assets. Two weeks ago, Mr. Kashkari's top staff, including an individual with a position entitled Interim Chief for Home Preservation and another in charge of whole mortgage loan acquisition, spoke with my staff about the Troubled Asset Relief Program's plans to purchase mortgage, troubled mortgage assets. Last week, the Treasury filed an interim tranche report required by the Emergency Economic Stabilization Act stating that Treasury's policy teams were still committed to preserving home ownership Rather than prevent foreclosures by acquiring troubled mortgage assets, as the Emergency Economic Stabilization Act authorized, Secretary Paulson announced on Wednesday that the Troubled Asset, Asset Relief Program would not buy mortgage assets. Instead, Treasury would exclusively continue along the path of providing preferred equity injections to hand-picked companies. Thus, the only significant use by Treasury of the funds Congress authorized to address the mortgage crisis underlying the financial crisis includes, among other things, propping up a Beverly Hills banker, subsidizing the evisceration of National City Bank, and the laying off of thousands of Clevelanders who work there, and indirectly funding the payment of bonuses, compensation, and dividends by financial firms that could not have afforded to make them without the TARP capital infusion. I think it's fairly obvious that Congress would have never passed the emergency economic Stabilization Act had it known how Treasury would marshal the resources it was given. There's a consensus among the business community, academics and policymakers, that the financial crisis will not be resolved until the mortgage crisis is resolved. There is a further consensus from experts, some of whom you will hear from today, that resolution of the mortgage crisis demands stronger action by the federal government than private industry so far has been willing to undertake. The Emergency Economic Stabilization Act enables Treasury to purchase and thereby control the mortgage servicing of potentially millions of mortgages that will soon go into default. That control, if exercised, would make a qualitative difference in the kind of loan modification that would be performed because the federal government would not and should not 
have followed the same restricted loan modification policies so far pursued by private investors to accomplish the social policy of protecting neighborhoods and preserving the financial system as a whole. Once TARP owned whole mortgage uh, loans acquired from the bank portfolios and securitized mortgage pools, TARP could direct mortgage servicers to make loan modifications in the principal balance of troubled mortgages. Now we're going to hear today from industry and academic experts alike about how critical this step is to fix our current mortgage crisis. Well, there's some disagreement among experts whether Treasury currently possesses sufficient authority to purchase mortgages and affect loan modifications over the full range of mortgage and mortgage-related assets. And there remains an issue whether Treasury should pursue a mortgage guarantee program to replace or complement an asset purchase and modification program. These technical questions, while important, should not obscure a fundamental fact. Treasury was uniquely empowered by Congress and positioned to embark on a range of foreclosure prevention efforts that could not be undertaken by the private sector. Treasury had the money and the technical challenges had solutions. Rather than undertake this difficult but crucial work, the Treasury Department has abdicated its responsibility to stem the tide of mortgage foreclosures. They have passed the responsibility back to the private sector and additional inadequate government efforts. Well, there are many hardworking and well-intentioned people in the industry striving to do loan modifications. The hard truth is that they are not keeping up with the number of borrowers needing modifications to prevent foreclosures and default. As a predictable result, foreclosures have continued to mount and millions more are forecast. Furthermore, experience is showing that there is a significant problem of redefault where borrowers who are among the lucky few to receive a loan modification at all are not receiving loan modifications that cure the dual problems of affordability and negative equity. Foreclosure is delayed but not prevented. Treasury's action to abandon acquiring troubled mortgage assets unfortunately, maybe tragically, leaves the problem of negative equity unresolved. I hope that today's hearing will permit us to have a thorough examination of the basis for the Treasury Department's decision to ignore the foreclosure prevention objective of the Trouble Asset Relief Program. As Congress may soon receive a request for a second installment of $350 billion towards the Trou Troubled Asset Relief uh, Program. And as we are on the eve of a new administration, which will have the opportunity to reconsider Secretary Paulson's decision, it would be helpful for members of Congress and to the next administration to understand the viewpoints and assess the judgment of the current Troubled Asset Relief Program leadership before deciding to entrust them the remainder of the bailout funds and continue their policies. Uh, at this time, uh, I'm pleased to recognize the distinguished Congress member from the state of California, Mr. Darrell Issa, who has uh, uh, been not just a ranking member of the subcommittee but a partner on expressing concern over so many of these issues that are reflected not only in the $700 billion bailout uh, but in uh, Treasury's management of it. Uh, Mr. Issa, I just want to thank you personally for uh, the efforts that you have made. They have been outstanding and I am pleased to be with you today having uh, you join Mr. Cummings and I. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And, uh, in that this may be the, the last hearing that you and I uh, do together in, in our pr present capacities, I want to thank you for two solid years of bipartisan uh, uh, cooperative work, uh, which uh, from a field hearing standpoint began with going to Cleveland and looking at this problem uh, approximately 18 months before the Treasury came and said they had a crisis that needed to immediately be handled. 
Mr. Chairman, today we're, I appreciate your holding this hearing and I appreciate the joint effort that brought our witness uh, to us today. Uh, focus of today's hearing is stated to be to determine whether or not the administration is following the intent of Congress embodied in the $700 billion financial bailout package related to mortgage foreclosure prevention. My interpretation of Mr. Kashari's uh, testimony and the remarks by Secretary Paulson on Wednesday demonstrate to me that the administration is ignoring congressional intent and reversing course of their original request. I don't know whether to call this fire ready aim or something more pejorative. I approach this issue with some, <clears throat> somewhat of an interest, uh, interesting perspective because I, like the Chairman, voted against the bailout not once but twice. Chairman Kucinich and I sometimes disagree on the proper role of the Federal Government. In fact, when it comes to some of the solutions that could be used under the TARP, we may, in fact, reach opposite conclusions. But I think we stand here today, or sit here today, united in two, uh, two parts of the problem. One, it was disingenuous in the way that the administration came to us with a crisis which ultimately could not have been a crisis as described because the money has not in any way, shape or form been used as it was uh, asked for. And two, that in fact Treasury's request for authority appears to be a request for a blank check of $700 billion rather than any definable use of the money other than vaguely saying the money would be used. Today, I find myself in an odd situation. I am asking whether I agree with the Chairman or not as to exactly what we are supposed to do with the money. I am asking should we, in fact, instead of authorizing the second $350 billion pursuant to the TARP, look at reallocating those funds to HUD or you know, actually to the VA and the FHA? Because, in fact, if we need to have uh, people be able to remain in their homes, it is very clear the Treasury cannot and will not make the effort to keep people in their homes. As I said more than 18 months ago, the Chairman and I went to Cleveland, and Mr. Chairman, I will be going to Cleveland after this hearing today, uh, because it's, it happens to be both of our homes in the Chairman's district, or historic home in my case. We saw that people in Cleveland were unable to keep their homes because the unwinding of the subprime began in those neighborhoods and those communities first, but it spread throughout the country. It wasn't until it spread to Wall Street that the administration came to us with the need for emergency funds. I think Congress should have known, and the Chairman and I, I think, did know, that there was something fairly disingenuous when it was a crisis related to home mortgage, but in fact was a crisis in Wall Street that, that prompted the action by Treasury. I appreciate the witness being here today. I will look forward to your testimony, although, quite frankly, Knowing what your testimony is going to be, I look forward more to the questions we are going to ask and, in fact, shedding some light on the real question of should Congress trust this administration to spend one more penny, and if we do, what will we get for that $350 billion that could well be spent and the remaining few dollars that are destined to go to AIG and other programs, not uh, individuals and companies not envisioned in the original uh, legislation. Last but not least, I will be asking two tough questions. Who have you sought to understand the complexity of the market that you clearly don't understand? And what are you going to do when you leave this hearing room today to live up to the expectation of Congress? With that, Mr. Chairman, I thank you again for holding this hearing and I yield back. I thank the gentleman. The uh, Chair recognizes uh, the distinguished gentleman from Maryland who has been very active on, on this subcommittee in uh, pursuing the answers to the questions that uh, members of Congress uh, perhaps should have been asking in the places like the Democratic Caucus. Mr. Cummings. I want to thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, for holding this hearing this morning. And I um, want to take just a moment, Mr. Chairman, to thank you for your leadership. Uh, I join with uh, others in saying that uh, you have done a phenomenal job at taking on some issues uh, that have not been the most popular. And, um, but I thank you and I am sure, as Mr. Issa has said, um, you, you have consistently stood up for 
the American people, um, and I want to thank you. I also, uh, Mr. Chairman, I'm going to take a, I only have three minutes, but I want to, yes, yes, I have five, thank you. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I also want to just, I cannot help, when I read this morning um, this statement in uh, this article in the Washington Post saying AIG to pay millions to top workers, I got to tell you, it made my heart ache. Um, Mr. Chairman, I, I, and I just have to comment on this, and I hope you will hear me, Mr. Kashkari. I don't think AIG gets it. I really don't think they get it. They don't get that Americans are suffering. They don't get that Citicorp laid off 10,000 people, U.S. Steel, 675. Morgan Stanley, 10% of his workers, approximately 44,000 people are employed, so that's quite a number. GM, 3,500. DHL, 12,000. Circuit City, 6,800. National City, 4,000. And I could go on and on and on, and these are announcements that have been made in the last month or so. My point is simply this, that I think AIG has gotten to the point, and I, and I, and I, I got to believe that they just don't get what's happening in the rest of the country. AIG has come to this Congress, and I did vote for the bailout, by the way, and I voted for it because my people were suffering in my district. I voted against it when it was House, voted for it when it came from the Senate. But the fact is, is that the people in my district are losing their houses too. The people in my district are also losing their jobs. And we, and, and I, we have an AIG that will go on these lavish junkets and as you probably know, they, they, because of this Congress, they canceled 160 junkets. And let's say that they averaged 200,000 to 250 apiece. That's a lot of money. For, some, for corporations that are dying, that is supposed to be dying, and would not be in existence. And then we open the paper today to hear that they are going to pay millions as if it's th everything is just the same as it was to their employee and employees and bonuses. Well, the problem is, is that a lot of the people that we represent won't even have a job at Christmas time and damn sure won't have a bonus. And so some kind of way, I hope that some, we can get through to AIG and other companies, because it's bigger than, than AIG. I don't want these companies coming to the Congress with a handout thinking that they can take the money, do whatever they want to do, and then, you know, have their little parties, have a good time, get their manicures, pedicures, massages, pay $1,600 a room, and then come dancing back to us and say, give me more, when the American people's tax dollars are being wasted. It is very upsetting. So, Mr. Chairman, this is an important addition to the full committee's investigation into what went wrong with the financial markets. We knew over years ago that our economy was headed for trouble when the housing bubble began to burst. The first victims were everyday Americans who had been sold loans they could not afford from dishonest brokers. We did all in our power to keep people in their homes and to keep the economy afloat, but we were fought at every turn by this administration. We asked the administration what authority they needed to keep the market from going bust, and their response was a non-response. They said we should let the markets be free. Let the invisible hand work out, work it out. Well, we know now what the invisible hand, that the invisible hand has failed. Wall Street has come to us, cashmere hat in hand, to ask us for $700 billion bailout to recover funds lost from risky deals it made. When times are good, those risks resulted in windfall profits and people got rich. But now that the tables have turned, the United States banking system is turning to the American taxpayer to bail them out, and the administration is fully behind them. This administration wants to privatize Wall Street's gains and socialize Wall Street's losses. Sadly, the situation is at such a fever pitch that we simply cannot afford to ignore it. The risky bets made on Wall Street were so complex that every single segment of our economy could fail if we, we do not bail them out. Further, we are seeing with the news a rippling effect 
in the European and Asian markets, the global economy is also on the brink of failure. It is for these reasons that I held my breath and voted for this bailout measure. I had initially voted, I am almost finished, Mr. Chairman, I initially voted against it because I thought the bill did not include sufficient oversight and did too little for Main Street and a lot of the people that we are going to be talking about today. But as with Katrina, the war in Iraq and any number of small issues this administration, smaller issues this administration has been charged with addressing, Congress has come along to clean up the mess. Unfortunately, we were not given sufficient time to fully examine what went wrong on Wall Street before we had to pass legislation. But I appreciate the opportunity, Mr. Chairman, to take a look at these extremely complex issues. I know that with these hearings, we and the American people will gain a greater understanding of what went wrong. And as a result, we will, we will arm ourselves with the information necessary to fully address the economic crisis. I anticipate that the $700 billion Band-Aid that we placed on this crisis will stunt the blow of Wall Street failures, but it will not be enough to insulate us from the failing markets. And with that, Mr. Chairman, I yield back, and I want to thank you for your courtesy. Uh, the Chair would like to remind uh, people in the audience that uh, you are here uh, as guests and this committee is going to enforce proper decorum and if we don't have it, you will be removed. Uh, the, um, uh, the committee and myself would like to uh, greet you, Mr. Kashkari. Thank you for being here today and uh, we are uh, we're grateful for your presence. I want to introduce uh, Mr. Kashkari to the members of the committee and to the uh, public. Uh, Mr. Neil Kashkari was designated as the Interim Assistant Secretary of the Treasury for Financial Stability on October 6, 2008. Uh, the Chair is going to uh, uh, pause for a second. Uh, Mr. Bilbray, uh, did, did, did you have an opening statement? Okay, fine. Just wanted to show our colleague the courtesy. So, uh, in his, in this capacity, Mr. Kashkari, as the Secretary of the Treasury for Financial Stability, oversees the Office of Financial Stability, including the Troubled Asset Relief Program. Mr. Kashkari is also the Assistant Secretary of the Treasury for International Economics and Development. He joined the Treasury Department in July of 2006 as senior advisor to U.S. <coughs> excuse me to U.S. Treasury Secretary Henry Paulson. In that role, Mr. Kashkari was responsible for developing and executing the Department's response to the housing crisis, including the formation of the Hope Now Alliance, the development of the subprime fast track loan modification plan and Treasury's initiative to kickstart a covered bond market in the United States. Prior to joining the Treasury Department, Mr. Kashkari was a Vice President at Goldman Sachs and Company in San Francisco. Uh, Mr. Kashkari, uh, thank you very much for appearing before this subcommittee today. It is the policy of the Committee on Oversight and Government Reform to swear in all witnesses before they testify. I would ask that you please rise and raise your right hand. Do you solemnly swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. Thank you, sir. Let the record reflect that the witness answered in the affirmative. Uh, Mr. Kashkari, I ask if you can, if you can uh, keep your uh, opening remarks to five minutes in length. Uh, your entire written statement will be included in the record of this proceeding, and we are very grateful for your presence. Uh, please begin. Uh, thank you, Chairman Kucinich. And please pull that mic a little bit closer. It's thank you, Chairman Kucinich, Ranking Member Issa, and members of the committee. Good morning, and thank you for the opportunity to appear before you today. I would like to provide you with an update on the Treasury Department's actions to stabilize our financial markets and restore the flow of credit to our economy. We have taken actions with the following three critical objectives. Number one, stabilizing the financial markets. Number two, supporting the housing market by avoiding preventable foreclosures and increasing mortgage finance, and three, to protect the taxpayers. We have acted quickly and in coordination with the Federal Reserve, 
the FDIC, and our colleagues around the world to help stabilize the global financial system, and it is clear that our coordinated actions are having an impact. Before we acted, we were at a tipping point. Credit markets were largely frozen, denying businesses and consumers access to vital funding and credit. Financial institutions were under extreme pressure and investor confidence in our system was dangerously low. We recognize that a program as large and as important as this demands appropriate oversight. We are committed to transparency and oversight in all aspects of this program and continue to take strong action to make sure that we comply with both the letter and the spirit of the requirements established by the Congress, including regular briefings with the Government Accountability Office, the Financial Stability Oversight Board, and the Inspector General, and we are committed to continuing to meet all of the reporting requirements established by the Congress. As the markets rapidly deteriorated in October, it was clear to Secretary Paulson that the most timely, effective step to improve credit market conditions was to strengthen banks' balance sheets quickly through direct purchases of equity. Working with our banking regulators, we have now approved literally dozens of applications from banks across the country, and we will very soon post the term sheet so private banks can participate. We feel very strongly that healthy banks of all sizes, both public and private, should use this program to increase lending in their communities. With a stronger capital base, our banks will be more confident and be better positioned to play their necessary role to support economic activity. Further in support of this goal, just two days ago, our banking regulators issued a statement underscoring the responsibility that banks across our country have in the areas of lending, dividend and compensation policies, and foreclosure mitigation. Treasury commends this action taken by the banking regulators and believes it is critical to focus on the importance of prudent bank lending to restore our economic growth so that we do not repeat the mistakes, the poor lending practices that are a major cause of our current economic problems. On housing, we have worked aggressively to avoid preventable foreclosures, to keep mortgage financing available, and to develop new tools to help homeowners. Here I will briefly highlight three key accomplishments. Number one, in October 2007, Treasury helped establish the Hope Now Alliance, a coalition of mortgage servicers, investors, and counselors to help struggling homeowners avoid preventable foreclosures. Through coordinated industry-wide action, Hope Now has significantly increased the outreach and assistance provided to homeowners. Hope Now estimates that nearly 2.5 million, 2.5 million homeowners have been helped since July 2007, and the industry is now helping about 200,000 per month avoid foreclosure. Number two, we acted earlier this year to prevent the failure of Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac, the housing GSEs that touch over 70% of mortgage originations. These institutions are systemically critical to financial and housing markets, and their failure would have materially exacerbated the recent market turmoil and profoundly impacted household wealth. We have stabilized the GSEs and limited systemic risk. And three, just three days ago, Hope Now, FHFA, and the GSEs achieved a major industry breakthrough with the announcement of a streamlined loan modification program that builds on the mortgage modification protocol developed by the FDIC and IndyMac. The adoption of this streamlined modification framework is an additional tool that servicers will now have to help avoid preventable foreclosures, and potentially hundreds of thousands of struggling borrowers will be helped to stay in their homes. On Wednesday, Secretary Paulson outlined three critical priorities and related strategies for the most effective deployment of remaining TARP funds. Number one, further strengthening the capital base of our financial system. Number two, supporting the asset-backed securitization market that is critical to consumer finance. And number three, increasing foreclosure mitigation efforts. These priorities are necessary to reinforce the stability of the financial system so that banks and other institutions critical to the provision of credit are able to support the economic recovery and growth and to help homeowners avoid foreclosure. In conclusion, our system is stronger and more stable than it was just a few weeks ago. 
Although a lot has been accomplished, we have many challenges ahead of us. We will focus on the goals outlined by Secretary Paulson and develop the right strategies to meet those objectives. Foremost among these will be to ensure that the financial system has sufficient capital to get credit flowing to businesses and consumers. Thank you for this opportunity, and I'd be happy to answer your questions. I thank the gentleman for his testimony. Uh, without objection, uh, members of the committee will be given 10 minutes each uh, to ask questions in the first round and five minutes each to ask questions in the second round of questions. Uh, and uh, without objection. Agreed. Uh, I, I also want to state for the purposes of your staff, Mr. Kashkari, that they might be prepared in the second round of questions to be uh, ready to answer questions about the decision of Treasury with respect to National City Bank and PNC. So if you could be ready for that, uh, that's a specific matter. We're going to have some uh, broad questions now that relate to the overall economy, but in the round two, please be ready because I'm going to have some questions about that. We I'm ready. Make sure they're prepared. I'm ready. Thank you. I'm glad you are. Okay. Uh, now, I, I, I heard your testimony and I have to say that I'm a little bit surprised because it appears that testimony was prepared before Mr. Paulson's statement about uh, the um, purposes of the Troubled Asset Relief Program and um, the Secretary's decision not to purchase mortgage assets through his decision. Hasn't Treasury re rendered obsolete entire sections of the Emergency Economic Stabilization Act uh, because there was no question about congressional intention that Treasury use an asset purchase program to mitigate foreclosures. Do you have a response to that? Congressman, thank you for asking that. It's a very important topic. Uh, we worked very hard with both houses of Congress to design the legislation to provide a lot of flexibility. And we and the other regulators are using every tool at our disposal to get at this problem, the stabilizing the financial system as well as helping homeowners. And Secretary Paulson and Chairman Bernanke and at Treasury, we have been looking at how do we deploy these resources to first stabilize the system so that we can get credit flowing to the entire economy, to our communities. And so Secretary Paulson made the determination that the best way to get at this problem, given how rapidly markets were deteriorating, was to lead with capital. But that doesn't mean that we don't care about other aspects that are very, very important. We're trying to use the right tool to solve the right problem. Well, it would appear, uh, Mr. Kashkari, that Secretary Paulson has gutted Section 109 of the Act, which requires Treasury to undertake specified steps to mitigate foreclosures with respect to the mortgages it acquires, including working with other federal regulators to directly uh, or to identify troubled assets to acquire to uh, further loan modification efforts. Um, how, how do you reconcile this policy reversal with Congress's uh, expectations laid out in the statute? Sure. It's a, it, Congressman, it's a very good question and I appreciate you raising it. There are other sections of the Act, as an example, that direct other government agencies, whether it's FHFA in its conservatorship of the GSEs, uh, FHA, uh, the Federal Reserve, to the extent that they own or control mortgages to take action. So let me give you an example, Congressman, because this point is very important. If we had spent all $700 billion buying loans, that would be around 3 million loans or so, depending on the value of the loans, but around 3 million, 3.5 million. Instead, if you look at the actions that we took on Tuesday, by using the GSEs to now set a new industry standard for loan servicing, when the GSE set a standard, other servicers around the country use that standard, whether it's for GSE loans or for other loans. Those actions and that protocol has the ability to influence servicing for almost every loan in America. There are 55 million residential mortgages in America. So, so we could touch you know, 3 million or 55. So it has the ability, but the, the problem is that Treasury, by taking this action uh, that de-emphasizes loan modification, has essentially sent a signal to all the banks that this isn't particularly what you're concerned about. I mean, even though you may maintain, oh, this is in there, look, 
I've got the act. Here's the purposes. I want to spell them out. The purposes of the act are, and number two, to ensure that such authority and facilities are used in a manner that protects home values. And, uh, and then it goes on to section uh, B, preserves home ownership. Now, the Treasury just, just basically cut that out of the bill. And what, you know, what we have here is a situation where uh, banks are, are hoarding the money that they're getting from the TARP. They're using the money to purchase other banks. We still have a credit freeze. I'm looking at your testimony. You're saying uh, credit markets were largely frozen, denying financial institutions, businesses, consumers access to vital funding and credit. Financial institutions were under, were under extreme pressure. Investor confidence in our system was dangerously low. Hello, are we in a different universe here? It's the same situation prevails today. And, and yet your testimony acts as though, well, you know, we're just merrily skipping along our way here. We, we've got millions of people threatened with losing their homes. And the underlying problem is that banks are now increasing their interest rates in order to get more customers. Think about this now. It's counterintuitive to your troubled asset relief program. You're now saying we're going to put the money into the banks, into these financial institutions, shore up finance capital. Well, finance capital now is seeing that the only way they can survive is to start to raise their interest rates and give away some of the money that they're giving, that the government's giving to them. At the same time, you're picking winners and losers. How do you reconcile these policy reversals? You know, and, it, and, uh, and why won't Treasury act swiftly and forcefully to maximize assistance to homeowners under TARP and play a significant role in modification of home loans in, in, uh, at risk of imminent default? Why not? Well, Congressman, you know, I, I'm glad you're raising this because I personally have spent most of the past year and a half focused on ways to try to reach and help homeowners. That's been my primary focus within Treasury. And it's a, it's a Why, well, ha issue. hasn't the Secretary listened to you? Is he, I mean, do you feel frustrated that Co your position isn't being uh, vindicated? Co Congressman, the Secretary is passionate about this as well. And permit me, please. Passionate about what? Helping homeowners, Congressman. Per he is? Where? Where? What country? We are, Congressman, we are using all the tools available to the federal government to get at the credit crisis and try to help homeowners. Let me give you an example, please. We have different uh, tools. Which I, are better I'm, you know, Mr. Kashkari, I, I really respect you being here. But I'm looking at a bill, Section 109, that spells all this out. This secretary just essentially took some scissors and cut it out and threw it away. Now, you know, maybe this is just some kind of a game to some people in the administration. They're on their way out of office and they just feel they can do whatever they want, pick winners and losers in the market. We've got millions of people losing their home. Mr. Mr. Issa came to my district and, and, and saw some of our old neighborhoods, how they're just falling apart. And we've got people that are holding on, hoping against hope that somebody's going to help them. We've got millions of people in foreclosure. And if I read it right, Mr. Issa, in California, there are millions more at risk of foreclosure with these jumbo mortgages and the Alt-A mortgages in 09 and, and 10. And all of a sudden, the Treasury sent a signal to the banks, forget about it. We're going to give you the money that you want, and you do what you want with it, unless you direct it Specifically, it's not going to happen. So tell me again, why isn't it happening? Not how passionate the Treasury Secretary is. Well, Congressman, I believe it is happening. And if you'll permit me, I'll walk you Please through Please go how. ahead. Um, the four banking regulators, the Treasury is not a regulatory agency. The banking regulators supervise the, the banks that are getting this capital. The four banking regulators put out a joint statement that's going to govern how they supervise these banks. One of the things that they're going to be looking very closely at and watching, not just executive compensation, not just dividend policies, making sure lending is getting out there in our communities, and foreclosure mitigation efforts. The banking regulators are the supervisors of these institutions, and they've now put out a joint statement saying exactly what they're going to be looking at in their supervisory capacity. There is no one better positioned in the country than the banking regulators to do that. Treasury is not in a position to do that, but the banking regulators absolutely are, number one. Number two, Congressman, again, if you look at all the tools available to us, housing and urban development has a very important role to play. This Congress, the President signed the Hope for Homeowners legislation, a $300 billion program to help housing just in July. And Congressman, that program is just getting up and running now. Treasury is involved in overseeing that program. That's making progress. The actions we're taking to get the industry to move more loan modifications, a systematic approach. That just got announced on Tuesday. 
We've done numerous, had numerous initiatives to try to get at the root of this problem. But the most important benefit, Congressman, for homeowners is that we didn't allow the financial system to collapse. Imagine how many foreclosures we would have if the banking system had collapsed and mortgage finance was not available to our homeowners. That's the biggest benefit that we've been able to achieve. And Chairman, we are not out of the woods yet, and I didn't mean to suggest that in my testimony, but I can walk through numerous statistics looking at the beginning of a healing credit market, which is the first step to getting through this problem. Well, maybe, maybe you know, see, again, this might be of some uh, a philosophical divide here. Because on one hand, the Bush administration and Treasury seems to indicate that uh, the trickle-down effect, give the money to the banks, and they're going to loosen up money and credit and start going to start to flow, and people are going to be protected. On the other hand, there's another model which says create a system where you, where you get pools of mortgage-backed securities the government takes control over and you direct loan modification, you know, lowering pr interest, lowering principal, extending the terms of payments to keep people in their home. One model may keep several big banks afloat, but risk millions of people losing their home anyway, and the other model keeps people in their homes. See, you're talking about an IFCOM model that's based on, on the uh, charitable sentiments, seemingly, of major uh, Wall Street banks. But the truth of the matter is, if you don't get the money at, into the grassroots and help on loan modification, the banks aren't going to get their money to begin uh, uh, at, at the end anyhow, because you know one model percolates up. Money goes to the banks, help move money in Wall Street. The other one, you have this idea of some kind of trickle down. A trickle never gets down. Everybody understands that. And yet, you, Treasury seems to cling to this notion that if only you, you know, the regulators now are, do their job. Are you kidding me? I mean. Regulators, look, Treasury has been given almost omnipotent power here. And, and you have unfortunately, you know, not uh, exercised in the interest of homeowners. Do you believe that Congress would have passed the ES, uh, EESA if it understood that none of the TARP funds would have been earmarked for asset purchase and subsequent uh, mortgage loan modifications? I mean, this looks like classic bait and switch. Do you want to respond to that? <clears throat> Congressman, um, I, I, I really appreciate and respect your perspective. We worked very hard in the middle of a crisis with the Congress to design the legislation to have broad flexibility so that we could adapt our strategies and our approaches based on what's happening in the markets and what we're seeing. And as we went to the Congress to ask for this authority and we negotiated the legislation, and I was very involved in all night sessions with, with both houses to, to do that, our credit markets were deteriorating much more quickly than we had expected. And so. Secretary Paulson had to take very aggressive action to stabilize the system. Again, with deep respect, sir, if we had spent all $700 billion on loans, that would be around 3 million loans. There are 55 million mortgages in America. 25 other million Americans own their homes outright. So there are 80 million homeowners in America. We could benefit 3 million directly by buying all their loans, or we could benefit every American by not allowing the financial system to collapse. That was our highest priority, Congressman. Well, just a brief response till we go to Mr. Issa, and that is that where we had foreclosures in the city of Cleveland, are you aware that where you have a lot of foreclosures in a neighborhood, the value of everybody's property drops? Yes, yes, sir. Okay, thank you, Mr. Issa. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Kashari, uh, I appreciate that you were in on those negotiations with uh, leadership. Uh, the majority of Republicans voted against it. Uh, once and twice. Uh, Mr. Kucinich wasn't in the meeting where Secretary Paulson came in with the Vice President and uh, Fed Chairman Bernanke and made all these assurances that there was absolutely a critical, immediate need to get rid of the corrosive derivative products, you know, all the different names for this and, you know, ubiquitous, you know, uh, sub S retraded credit default swap, blah, 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 blah. Okay. But they, they talked about them as though they knew what the hell they were. You got the money and you immediately said, what items, what auction? Would you please respond to, under oath, when did you go from what you, did, what you told? members of Congress in open and closed sessions was the absolute reason to have this money immediately to buy a specific group of assets, about $350 billion in the U.S., about $350 billion held by other countries and, and, and other uh, funds outside the U.S. Those assets were what you said was locking up and destroying the market. 
When did you first hear that that money was not going to be spent that way? Uh, Congressman, uh, the day on October 3rd, the day that the Congress passed and the President signed the legislation, we immediately created several policy teams developing asset purchase programs, all the details, both mortgage-backed securities. Now, that wasn't the question. No, I'm, please yeah, but, no, I, I want to know the As time and date because I want to know whether Congress was lied to or whether there was a, a, a team all along that had an alternate, one or more people that had an alternate idea of how this money would be spent. Uh, Congressman, uh, forgive me, on October 3rd, we created a team. No, no, that no that's not answering program. the question. And, and here's the reason I'm asking a very please. directed question. You can create the team. You can put together all that. Okay. You know, look, people, you know, Circuit City, and, and I, I sold them for 20 plus years, so I'm very sensitive to the, the trouble they're in. Circuit City announced that they were closing 155 stores and began that process. They never announced they were filing Chapter 11. But all of us looked and said, look, they're not going to renegotiate walking away from 155 leases without a bankruptcy. So in our minds, we knew, you know, it's a, it's a question of time. Well, they don't tell you one thing, they do tell you another. You never in any good faith explained why you formed these organizations and now you say it's hopeless and impossible to buy these, these products that were the entire reason. You can't have the success for doing something different than you said without explaining why you didn't buy one of those assets. And when did somebody figure out, by date, when did you first learn that we were not going to buy these assets because we couldn't value them properly? First of all, Congressman, we, it's not a question of our ability to value them. The decision was made by Secretary Paulson uh, very recently, it, it, as early earlier this week, late last week, when we had finished a lot of our work. It's not just a question of valuing the assets. For asset purchases to work, it has to be done in scale. And when credit markets deteriorated that quickly, much faster than we thought, in late September and early October, he made the decision with Chairman Bernanke to lead with equity. So now the $700 billion is no longer $700 billion of asset purchases. We've allocated $250, so that's $450. And we made the decision, as we've watched how this has worked and how the markets have responded, the markets may need more capital. And now you're left with an asset purchase program that is much smaller than the original $700 billion. And so we can do it. We've done all the work. We know how to do the asset purchase program. But we want to use the capital to its maximum benefit for the financial system. And okay. Well, let, let me follow up on, on what you now want to do, uh, because I want to be respectful of, of the time of every member up here. Uh, well, first of all, let me, let me ask you a question, which is a, a fact-finding question. Organizations like the Professional Services Council, the Information Technology Association of America, and others would like to help and have been reaching out to Treasury on, on helping you understand and model uh, you know, what you want to do with this. They believe they can, they can in fact, help you. Have you met with any of these uh, organizations? I don't know the organizations you named personally. Uh, we have teams of people who have met with dozens or hundreds of organizations soliciting the best ideas and looking at the services that they can provide. And so we welcome ideas and we get a lot of ideas every day and look at them very seriously. Would you commit to, uh, to meet with these organizations to at least see what help they could give you to model uh, the problem and, and perhaps find better solutions than you presently have? Uh Absolutely. The only hesitation I offer is that we have a very formal procurement process, and I don't want to do anything that would advantage or disadvantage now, anybody. The Information Association of America is, is a 501C. Uh, Wonderful. Then I'd be happy to meet with them. They're not selling a product. Okay. okay uh, secondly, it has been said that your purchases of $250 billion plus of preferred stock is at a price that would not be market competitive, meaning you paid too much. Tell me why I am to believe for a minute that those preferred stocks that you bought, you could resell today for anything close. Remember, the market has improved. You have said that. Tell me what the profit would be on those, those preferred stocks if you put them, began putting even $1 of them into the market today. Uh, Congressman, I don't know what the, what the price would be. Okay. We well, you are from Goldman today. Sachs. You I know? used to work there. Okay. Well, from and I'm from Directed Electronics. You're from your last job. If if you tell me that you've improved the market, then by definition, those assets, if bought at par, have appreciated. Isn't that true? Well, there are many 
again, with deep respect, Congressman, there are many different markets. There's the equity market. There's the credit markets. I think there are strong signs. I can walk you through data showing the credit markets improving. The equity markets, we purchase equity. The equity you markets are you, know, you purchased a debt instrument. Well, it's, it's tier one capital, Congressman. You know, we can go ring around the rosy here, but you're here today because Congress is feeling that you played a bait and switch game. And you're not convincing anyone that you haven't. But let's, let's just try to go to the fundamentals. You bought preferred stock. Yes, sir. Preferred stock is a dead instrument. You're capitalizing the company, but you're capitalizing with a dead instrument. Those instruments trade. I have BB&T. I, uh, uh, well, I have a number of, of, of dead instruments of that sort. They have, in fact, appreciated from the time you bought till today. In, in various portfolios. So I'm looking at those and I'm following a lot more of those kinds of instruments. They have appreciated. So my question to you today, under oath, as someone who should know about this is, are your purchases above par today in your opinion? Candidly, Congressman, I don't know. We have an independent valuation firms that are going to provide regular reporting on the current well, valuation. Regular reporting starting when? You're here today. Do you have any regular reporting from the day you bought them till today? We've, we've published the reports to the Treasury website uh, within 48 hours of completing the transactions on the terms. And then we're, right now we're in the process. Just yesterday, the equity asset manager solicitations concluded. And we've received, I think, hundreds of proposals. We'll be engaging the equity asset managers who will be providing us the valuation services and the reporting to the Congress on a go-forward basis. Well, wouldn't it be reasonable for us to believe here today that if, in fact, you have improved the market, that those assets that you purchase, we'll call them equity since they're a hybrid, have appreciated? I think they'd be reasonable comp if relative to the day that we bought them. Okay, I think that so that's reasonable. If, if we find out on the next report, which I hope is forthcoming and we will be looking for it, that they are below par, then in fact you paid too much, right? Well, it, again, it depends, Congressman, what our objective was. Our objective was to create a program that would encourage thousands of banks across our country to voluntarily apply and to use the capital. And so we intentionally made it attractive for them to want to apply. So you believe here today that you had authority to subsidize banks, including providing them this capital at a below par, a below fair market of a market that should have existed but didn't exist? Well, Congressman, as you know, the, the market when we did this was there was no market. Company, most banks couldn't raise private capital. Yeah, but, but we're, no, no, but we're in a so, better market but, today. You understand, the, one of the reasons for the question is you've, you've thrown $350 billion, including AIG and so on, out there. You're coming back for another $350 billion. If, in fact, what we've, we discover, and I believe here today, is that your $350 billion, and let's just look at $250 billion, we'll leave AIG, which is a whole other can of worms, aside. If that money, in fact, is a subsidy arriving at a price below the fair market price, thus causing banks to choose you, including banks in my district, choose you instead of other capital, all you've really done is give them a discount capital. Now, the reason I ask that is, how large is the capital base necessary for the banking industry in America? Do you have any idea? Isn't it about $55 trillion plus or minus? In terms of assets or uh, capital? Ca or the size of the market, if you will. That, that sounds about right. I don't have okay, the numbers so, in my fingers. So you, you'd have to put several trillion dollars in to, to, to be the owner, if you will, of, 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 of that base. Of all even, the capital. Even with the multiple. So uh, the reason I'm asking all this, and I, I know I've got to yield back my, or I've, I've extended my time and just follow up one last time. If all you're doing is moving your money in at a discount to banks and, and entities like American Express and uh, GMAC and everybody else who's rushing to become a bank holding company today as a result of this deal, then at the end of the day, we will have bought stock at too high a price or debt at too low a, uh, an interest rate, however you want to look at these preferred instruments, and we will have moved people to other capital where they can get the returns they want because you're competing at a price that the market wouldn't, wouldn't accept the loans. You're giving them a deal that, that distorts the market. Isn't that true based on your background at Goldman? Well, well, Congressman, when you have a market that is dysfunctional 
any deal that we would put in, because we would be the only provider of capital, would by definition be better than the non-available capital in the middle of a crisis. So, yes, we did offer attractive terms to stabilize the market. Mr. Chairman, I, I might note that uh, Warren Buffett weighed into this with billions of dollars. Wells did a deal. There have been dollars done, but those dollars, I believe, are not coming in until the United States quits subsidizing in competition to private sector dollars that would ask for a better return and probably, no, undoubtedly would say that dividends and, in, and excess compensation would have to be curtailed until they were getting their returns. I yield back. I, I thank the gentleman. And, you know, there, uh, there was a reason why I uh, voted with the gentleman twice on, on this uh, same question, the bailout. Uh, we now uh, recognize for a period of uh, 10 minutes uh, Mr. Cummings of Maryland. Mr. Cummings, you thank may proceed with your question. Thank you very much, Mr. Ch Mr. Chairman. Mr. Kush Kerry, uh, I must say that uh, as I have sat here listening to your answers, um, I, I have been disappointed. I think that um, you have kind of skipped around the issues here and I say that because when I saw pictures of you, I thought, you know, I said, this looks like a guy that will be a straight shooter. So I'm going to ask you some questions, sir. And I don't say that trying to embarrass you. I say it because life is short. And I don't have time to hear ring around the rosy answers. Uh, let me go back to something that the chairman said. He talked about how, whether you understood that when foreclosures take place, he said, he asked you, did you realize that it also affects the housing in the communities? In other words, you sell a foreclosed house, it's lower price, price value goes down. Let me ask you this follow-up question to that. You also understand that when price value goes down, local government is affected because it's based upon the tax dollars are based upon that. So, and it just goes on and on and on. So it's a very serious problem that we are dealing with here. Do you, and I guess what I'm, I always, every time I sit in these hearings, I always try to put myself in the position of my constituents who are watching this. Because when I come home, hopefully I'll get home about 3 o'clock today, I live in the inner city of Baltimore, and believe me, when I go to the supermarket tonight, when I go take my daughter to the movies this evening, I promise you people are going to ask me about you. And what they're going to say is, Cummings, we watched the hearing. We heard that guy, Cash Curry. But I'm losing my house today. And they're going to ask the question. They're going to say, well, we heard about the Citigroup thing where I've got to be three months behind before I can get help. And we heard that guy, Cash Carey, we know he's in charge of the $700 billion. What can he tell me today? I do not want a handout. I just want a hand. I want to pay my mortgage. I just need a little help because this Bush administration and its policies has put me in a position where I don't have a job. Or I'm now working a part-time job. Help me. Did I miss something, Cummings? What can Mr. Kashkari, did, I, did he say something to help me know how I can help my family? That's what they're asking. They are in pain. Now, I'm giving you, your, you're on TV. You're the man. I don't know how much we're paying you, but you're our employee. And I'm asking you to look in the camera, somebody back here, and tell those people what you are doing. They hear about the bailouts of Wall Street. They hear that their tax dollars are being paid to AIG and these people going on these junkets and all that. They hear all of that. But they feel like it's ring around the rosy. They hear a lot of nice talk, but they're still being put out of their houses. They hear Paulson get up and talk of all this wonderful stuff, but they still are worried about whether they're going to come home and their stuff is going to, all of their furniture is going to be on the street. Those are the people that I represent. So I'm, just, I'm begging you to please tell me exactly what is being done. And then I want you to do something else. With Fannie Mae, 
announcing Monday that it had lost $29 billion. And you talked about all the wonderful things that Fannie Mae is going to do. I'm wondering how that affects, I know we got $100 billion that can go into, into their, their coffers, but how does that affect them helping that guy that I just talked about? And, 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 and I'm saying, I mean, I hear you guys talk about the urgency of the market and all of that, but something tells me that you need, and I think this is where the chairman is coming from, you know, we can fix Wall Street, but it seems like there's a, a bucket down there at the bottom, this, these people that are being thrown out of their whole houses, it's like a bucket with a hole in it. So whatever you do for Wall Street, if you're not saving these mortgages and helping people stay afloat, and by the way, saving some pain, I mean, it, it makes no sense. And so help me with that, because, because my people don't believe that you all care about them. And I hate to tell you that, but they don't. And they're angry. Thank you, Congressman. Um, I, I appreciate and share your perspective. Uh, let me say two things, please. One, the legislation that we asked for, we asked for it to try to stabilize and prevent a complete financial collapse of our financial system. And ev that was not to help Wall Street. That was to help every American. Please, sir, please. No, no, no let me tell you something. I understand that. That's why I voted for it. Yes, sir. But let me tell you, when we gave them money, when we give the, gave the banks money, money, they still weren't loaning any money. Well, let's talk about that, because we are passionate about getting the banks to loan money in our communities to help our small businesses and to help our homeowners. First of all, we allocated $250 billion for banks of all sizes across the country, and just about half the money is out the door today. I think we're going to approve another 20 banks today, large and small, across the country. Potentially thousands of banks are applying, and it's going to take a few months to process the thousands of transactions to get the money out the door. So we're working as fast as we can. We're working around the clock to process all these to get the money in our community banks, first of all. Number two, our banks are still, we're still at a period of very low confidence in the system. It's, a, it's gotten better in the last few weeks, but we have a long way to go. And until, and as we see confidence begin to be restored in our system, we're going to see our banks feeling more confident in themselves and more willing to extend credit, and our businesses and our consumers more willing to take on their own loans. So it, unfortunately, it's not going to happen overnight, but we're working very hard to get credit in our communities. And I would say one other comment, respectfully. This legislation was focused on stabilizing the system for everybody, for every American, but it is different than a plan to, it's not a stimulus. It's not an economic growth plan. It is an economic stabilization plan to stabilize the financial system. And so I just want to respectfully set expectations that we are trying to use these resources to stabilize the system for every American. But we also have real economic challenges that we all need to work through. And this by itself is not going to solve all of our economic challenges. I got that. Let me, let me ask you this. I had a conversation yesterday with a fellow named Joe Haskins, who's head of the Harbor Bank, which is a small bank in Baltimore. Uh, African-American-owned bank, um, and he was telling me yesterday that one of the problems is, is that you all are financing these big banks, and the little banks, the little community banks that did it right, in other words, they kept the loans, they didn't sell them. So you know how that works, they, they're going to make sure they make good loans. He wasn't, this stuff, this stuff that these, with all of these foreclosures, it doesn't affect them so much, except for people that may have lost their jobs. Right. But as far as not properly vetting people for these loans, didn't have a problem with that. But one of the problem, what his problems is, is that while he did it all right, you all are, are financing all of these other banks, these big banks, and he's worried that they then try to acquire, using our taxpayer dollars, the guys who did it right then try to acquire the little banks who, who, who the, the guys who did it wrong tries to acquire the little guys who did it right. Let's talk about that, Congressman, because that's a very important point. We've created a program for all banks of all sizes, big and small, the same terms. So the first nine banks that we funded have the same terms as number 10, number 100, number 1,000. So you're the, the gentleman in your community Harbor Bank, Harbor Bank in Baltimore. Can, can apply, can download the application off of the Treasury website or their regulator's website, submit it to their primary regulator, and it will come into our process. 
and we'd welcome it. We want banks of all sizes to use this program so they can, because they're the ones lending in our communities. We need them. We need the good banks to take the capital. Right. They're in the best position to make new loans. That's yeah. exactly who we want in the program. Yesterday, you probably know this, but yesterday we had, right where you're sitting, Mr. Paulson was sitting there, the guy who made $3 billion last year on hedge funds. Mr. John Paulson. Yeah, yeah. And we, we had uh, George Soros and James uh, Simons and Simmons and Philip Falcone and a fellow named Kenneth Griffin. You probably know those guys. And one of the things that they said yesterday was when they were talking about what you all are doing, they said they need to be doing more and doing more and, and, and urgently getting, helping those folks who are losing their houses. They said it just makes sense. And I'm, I'm sitting here and I'm saying these are the billionaires. And they've figured it out. And they showed tremendous sensitivity with regard to the folks at the bottom, the people that are losing their houses. And I'm just, and, and then Mr. Issa asked you a, a great question. He apparently uh, mentioned uh, several organizations. And I'm just wondering, are you all, who are you all seeking advice from? Because I'm just wondering, you know, it just seems like, in other words, we want, as I close, Mr. Chairman, we want the rubber to meet the road. But I'm wondering if the, the rubber ever really meets it. In other words, going back to my initial statement, if people see their tax dollars being spent on everything else, and I, I get it. That's why I voted for it, the bailout. But they can't, they, they want to, they, and they're not so much worried about themselves because, as you know, 95% of the people are fine with regard to their mortgages. But they're now worrying about their neighbors. They're worrying about the tax base. They're worrying about all and I just, and I just, I plead with you, we've got to find a way to, to more rapidly get to help the little guy and lady who are trying so hard and so desperately to deal with their mortgages. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Did you want to say something? Well, well thank you, Congressman. Again, I, I share your perspective. I've spent, as I mentioned, the past year and a half working with nonprofit counselors to get them, the interesting thing, if you'll, if you'll indulge me for just a moment, when we first started working on this problem, we found that counselors had a lot of great ideas, the banks had their own ideas, and the two weren't talking to each other. And so one of the first things that I personally did was I said, look, we are, we're all in this together, let's get the best ideas on the table, and let's not care, point fingers on who's at fault, let's just get the best ideas to try to reach and help homeowners. And so I personally feel passionate about that. And I think many of the programs that we're working, if you look at some of the st statistics on the rate of loan modifications over the past year, you know, more than triple the rate of where it was when we started this a year ago. It's not been quick to turn the industry, but we've made a lot of progress and people now are embracing loan modifications. We shouldn't underestimate how powerful what the action on Tuesday is. We've now established an industry standard using Fannie and Freddie to push it out to the whole industry on a fast track loan modification process to get homeowners into long-term affordable mortgages. It's not going to be perfect, but we're taking very aggressive action and using, trying to use the right tool for the right job. Uh, the gentleman's time expired. Uh, you, Mr. Bilbray. Thank you, Mr. Kashkari. Um, I guess you uh, sort of get a taste of how Mel Gibson felt in the last scenes of Braveheart, huh? Uh, look, you're probably the best spokesman that the administration has, and I want to compliment you on that. Um, you come across with more credibility than anybody else that I've heard across the, this dais. Um, but let me tell you something. When you sit there and make a statement like the administration trying to communicate with the, the banking institutions, let me tell you, the, the, my constituents in northern San Diego County remember great communication between the administration and the bankers in 05 and 06 when they were given an okay for banks to give loans out to people that didn't have, didn't have um, legal documentation or I, viable IDs in violation of the RICO provisions. And it was just, don't worry about it, just you can open the bank account, give the loan. You don't have to check um, viable identification if they fall into a certain category. And I don't know when the law ever created a, a, a gap in the RICO provision for the administration to tell banks that they give out loans to people who did not have viable identification. You know of any time that there was a? I, I do not, sir. Okay, but you do. You do know that that was going on. Well, I, I can tell you, 
I mean, I'm as outraged as you are about the poor lending practices that were allowed to go on earlier in this decade. And well, that's let me why tell we're you, here. It was a hot issue in my district, and the administration itself said, no, this is okay for these guys to do it. They actually locked on and, and approved of a program that was identified as violation of a RICO provision, breaking federal law, and they basically said this really isn't a breaking. We really don't require viable identification for this segment of the population. And I didn't know there was any exemption there. And uh, forgive me, I, I, I'm not familiar with it, but I, I take you at your word, sir. Okay, well, when we, FDIC just announced that they want to come in with some kind of program to focus on homeowners on this. What, you know, and the, the feedback I've gotten is that the Treasury Department's got some real problems with that. What's your problem with that, that strategy? Sure. I'll, I'll make a couple points. We've worked closely and have a lot of respect for Chairman Baer and her ideas, and, and candidly, it was really her ideas that led to the development of the program that was rolled out on Tuesday. Set that aside. Uh, the, the FDIC proposal, at the end of the day, is a spending proposal. When Secretary Paulson came to the Congress to ask for the authority for $700 billion, that was $700 billion to make investments, whether it be buying assets or buying equity. It was buying a financial instrument that would offer a return that we could sell over time to hopefully make back the taxpayers' money. That is fundamentally different than just having a government spending program, however well intentioned and however well designed it is, it's just very different. And so to go, and, and this is something that Secretary Paulson, he, he thinks it's a very interesting idea that Congress should look at it very seriously and consider it, but to take the $700 billion when we told the taxpayers we'd be buying assets that we could then sell, it's just different than saying we're going to take 20 or 50 or $100 billion and spend it with no chance of ever getting that back into the program. So it's just very different from what the program was structured to be investing versus spending, number one. And then number two, Congressman, we also have to, in all of these programs, we have to look very carefully at who's helped by them. There are programs out there when you actually scratch beneath the surface, helps homeowners, but maybe it ends up helping the banks a lot more than actually helping homeowners. And so some of the programs, sometimes Wall Street firms will bring us proposals they, they couch them as homeowner preservation. They're helping the banks and helping mortgage-backed securities investors. And so we have to look at all of these very carefully to understand who they're helping. But the biggest challenge is it's fundamentally spending. You're not going to get the money back versus investing. And that's yeah, just the, very the, different. The TARP, is, the TARP is not in isolation. I mean, we, we start off and set the precedence with the bailout of Freddie and Fannie. Now, we're not bailing out Freddie and Fannie. We're actually administering um, loan by loan, or are we doing an umbrella package there? On, oh, excuse me, sir, on the institutions or the, the mortgages? The institutions. The institutions, uh, again, we're buying preferred stock in the institutions to stabilize the institutions, and the taxpayers have warrants on 79.9%. So is there any reason why we should be surprised that when we got to the TARP you didn't take the same strategy? Uh, our strategy evolved as conditions changed. And so when Fannie and Freddie, again, they deteriorated very quickly through July and August, and that bold act, the Secretary came to the Congress to ask for that authority. The Congress provided it, and he took very bold action with, the, with Chairman Bernanke and with Mr. Lockhart to stabilize them. Similarly, we led with an asset purchase program because, in our judgment at the time, that was the best way to help the financial system, but market conditions deteriorated so quickly we again had to move with equity first. Okay, when you talk about the financial system, are we talking now that um, we're not going to pick and choose, we're going to get into Bank of America and credit card companies? You mean, uh, forgive me, with respect to what Secretary Paulson talked about on Wednesday in terms of consumer credit and making it available? That's a program that we're developing with the Federal Reserve to get credit flowing directly to consumers, whether it's credit cards or it's auto loans or student loans, potentially mortgages as well. So we are talking about moving into that field. We're, we're looking at it as a way, because right now what's happened is the markets have frozen, and so credit card rates are going through the roof, auto loan rates are going through the roof, and it's impacting families directly, and that's impacting our economy as a whole. And so we're looking at a program that could unfreeze that market to get credit flowing again. So are we talking about the possibility of a 2 percent federal loan to, um, to American Express? No, uh, that, that program would be structured where, uh, much like the Federal Reserve has set up a, a facility to get the commercial paper market going again, yeah. it's not directly going to the, uh, the, the banks or the lenders or the commercial paper, the issuers. It's just getting the market working again. We do something similar here 
to get the liquidity going in the uh, asset backed market. So the credit card market, the auto loan market, this would help all of our auto dealers, it would help the auto companies, it would help all of the retail industry that relies on the credit card business to work. Right now, as you, I think the chairman said, you know, credit card rates are being increased right now in large part because these markets are broken. 22% is a nice little. It's a big number. And so l let's take a step back, if you'll permit me. We have the banking financial sector and the non-banking sector. The banking sector provides about 60% of credit in our economy, the non-banking about 40%. Our initial actions have now stabilized the banking sector, and we feel good about that. There's more work to be done. But the non-banking sector is now frozen. And so we're looking at what actions we can take to get that working again. And yeah, let's talk about we're always going after the federal, you know, the taxpayers' money is the only way we can be able to interject and save the economy, whatever. Um, there was a whole discussion about a half a trillion dollars of American assets overseas that could come back if we held it harmless, the repatriation issue. Do you, uh, have you been following what the IRS did with um, the grace period for repatriated funds? F forgive me, Congressman, not closely. I well, they went from, they, they increased it from six months to ten months. Okay. you have any idea why they would do that? Honestly, sir, no. I'm just not focused on those issues. Uh, I'm spending 100 percent of my time executing the TARP. Okay. I, I just, you know, Mr. Chairman, I just think that, you know, we need to take a look at it. And I think the, the IRS was on to something, and that is it's always quick to use taxpayers' money to be able to go in there. And we're actually taking money that's coming out of, uh, out of our general fund to go after this, but we wouldn't hold harmless private money coming in from out of the country and investing back here because we want our pound of flesh. And now the, uh, the IRS has recognized that by at least extending the, the grace period because they see there's a huge amount of asset. That be, I mean, and to be blunt with you, as somebody who's worked with the federal government since 1976, I mean, uh, the, um, uh, the chairman and I were elected uh, the council and the mayors together um, back in 78. Um, the federal government does not manage assets um, very efficient at all. I'll tell you, that's one of our biggest frustrations those of us in local government have. But the fact is that this thing is going to come back to bite us with it when we could allow private sector funds to get in there and try to get involved if we just didn't want to take our pound of flesh and drag it into Washington, D.C. Well, Congressman, not only I completely agree with you, and one of our, some of our plans are designed specifically to attract private capital to come in because we don't think the taxpayers should do all of this themselves. The private sector should be encouraged to do that. And one of the things that the Secretary talked about on Wednesday was a potential capital program that involved a matching component. If a firm went and raised a dollar of uh, equity that the government would provide some kind of matching as a carrot to go get the private capital coming back in our system. So we agree 100 percent with the spirit of that. Yeah, let me tell you, as one member, I saw the bailout of Freddie and Fannie come up and said, oh, this will take care of it, then we take care of that. And all I have seen Washington, including the administration, talk about is how we are going to spend taxpayers' money, not how we are really reforming the process. We did the, bank, we, we did the, the guarantees on, on the deposit insurance. That was in a step. But that is a very small step compared to a whole lot of the other stuff that we have not gone back and touched base on. I mean, we haven't even re redefined mark to market yet. We are not even talking about that anymore. That is sort of left behind and don't worry about it. But I think there are some major issues that we need to talk about. And the administration is only talking about how we are going to spend the taxpayers' money, not about how we are going to avoid it. And this is one of those things as a father, if one of my children came in and said, Dad, I am deep in debt. I need you to bail me out. The first thing I do is not write a check. It would be ask for the credit cards. And we are not even asking for the credit cards. We are not asking for the reforms. We are basically just, again, writing a lot of checks. Well, Congressman, I, I share your frustration. Uh, our, our energy is focused on stabilizing the financial system, but there are profound regulatory and structural questions that we as a country have to ask and answer in the near future. What to do with Fannie and Freddie? What role the government should play in mortgage finance going forward? What we have done in the case of Fannie and Freddie, which were on the verge of collapse, is to stabilize them, to buy us all time, so we as a country and the Congress and the next administration can have that debate and make a thoughtful decision. But we needed to stabilize the system. And that's what our actions have been focused on. And you know, we're all frustrated by how many actions we've had to take. We don't want to do these kind of actions, but we've needed to to stabilize the system. But we need to have that thoughtful discussion so we don't get here again in the future. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, somewhere down the line, we're going to have to talk about 
who has actually been subsidized on this? Well, you have got foreign nationals, you have got people that are not legally present in the United States, you have got people that I have a constituent that cries about a home being lost when it is their seventh home that has, you know, has two or three homes that have used the system. You have people that have leveraged this. And then you have the innocent people that basically are just trying to play by the rules. And somewhere down the line, I think the American people are going to ask us to separate these groups and make sure that our resources are going to those who, who deserve to be helped on this game. I, I thank the gentleman. We are going to move on to our second round of questioning. And uh, I just want Mr. Kesh uh, Kari to be aware that we may have a third round uh, of questioning. This is going to be a five minute round. And I will begin. Um, you, I indicated to you at the beginning that I would have some questions about the National City Bank uh, transaction with uh, which uh, PNC took over National City with the help of the Treasury Department. Uh, do you, when you look at the, the money that you are giving to banks, and you are picking winners and losers, it is not arguable you are picking winners and losers. You picked a winner, PNC, and you picked a loser, National City Bank. Now, were you aware at the time that National City Bank uh, had um, a, a, a relative history prior to uh, the transaction involving PNC of being under attack by short sellers? Did you know that? Uh, Congressman, um, with deep respect, it is not appropriate for me to speak about an individual institution, but I can talk generally about well, these types respect, of Well, with deep respect, you know, you put 4,000 people out of work in the, in the City of Cleveland. You're, you know, if, are you taking the Fifth Amendment here? No, sir. I, first of all, Congressman, as I, I think you know, I was born and raised in Northeastern Ohio. I, listen, up, I'm, I I'm, the, I'm the representative account. of Northeast Ohio, and I'm asking you a question. Yes, sir. Can you answer the question? Did you know that National City was the target of short sellers? I think many financial institutions, including National City, were the target of short sellers. Did, did you know that uh, National City stock had been undervalued, according to Oppenheimer? Uh, I'm not, I did not know that. Did you know that National City's uh, debts had, had been overstated, according to many analysts? I did not know that. Did you know that credit rating agencies were given credit, literally, with pushing National City off a cliff? Did you know that? No, sir. Do you look at the role of credit rating agencies in, in terms of uh, determining who gets uh, troubled asset relief and who does not? Well, Chairman, if you'll permit me to walk you through our process. I, before you start walking me, I, I'm, I want to be careful really about where you're Chairman. walking me. Let me just, can you answer the question about credit rating agencies? We, don't, we do not look at credit rating agencies when deciding uh, who to make an investment into. May, may I please, sir, walk you through the process? I, I'm going to keep asking you questions here. Okay. Uh, on October 24th, National City Bank uh, was bought out by PNC for $5.2 billion, and they used $7.7 .7 billion of TARP funds. Did Treasury give PNC $7.7 .7 billion of TARP funds? Uh, PNC has not yet received any money from the Treasury Department. Did they agree to give them $7.7 .7 billion? We have not. PNC has publicly stated that they received preliminary approval. We, again, Congressman, the reason I'm Speaking this way, isn't there is a yes have, or no answer here? We have a very strict process for how we disclose information about individual institutions, and I want to respect those institutions. You're, you're not, testifying before a congressional committee. If you can't answer the question, then you, you have a constitutional right not to answer. I can inform well, you of that. I, I, I do not want to put an institution at risk by revealing supervisory confidential information. Are you, are you, are you invoking your constitutional no, privilege? No, sir. Uh, since you are not, you are saying that you cannot tell this committee what actually went on. I can tell you, Congressman, that when, first of all, when a bank submits an application to apply for TARP funds in the capital purchase program, that application is reviewed by its primary federal regulator, and then that regulator makes a recommendation to Treasury. I can tell you that we have never received an application from National City Bank to the Treasury to apply for TARP funds. And when we do receive recommendations from the regulators, we look very closely at those recommendations. You are saying National City never helped ask the Treasury for help? I have never seen an application from National you, you City. You have no knowledge that regulators denied a request saying the firm was too weak to uh, save? Uh, again, the, the regulators do go to some banks that they think are not solvent institutions and discourage them from applying to the did program. You put any, did you put any conditions on PN, uh, PNC? Uh, with respect to the $7.7 .7 billion? We told if a bank comes to us and wants to apply for funds in, as part of an acquisition, they will only get 
if it's approved by the regulator or recommended by the regulator, they will only get the target share upon closing of the transaction. Uh, can so you there tell are this, conditions. Can you tell this committee why you thought National City was too weak to save? Do you consider the negative effects on, on uh, local employment and ripple effects of more layoffs in an economically depressed region? I mean, you think about it. Congress, in its wisdom, uh, Mr. Issa, and you and I talked about this, uh, we, we fought for some provisions that would help inner cities that were suffering uh, from the most foreclosure. Cleveland uh, certainly qualified for that. Don't you look at the impact of your decisions on regional economies? Do you give it any consideration at all? Congressman, we review applications that the regulators submit to us with their recommendations. If a regulator does not submit an application to Treasury because a regulator deems a financial institution is going to fail, we can't review it. And I don't think it's a good use of taxpayer money to put taxpayer capital into a financial institution that's going to fail. Well, you know what? That, that statement that you just made, you will hear about for the rest of your career. Uh, my time has expired. Uh, I'm going to come back to this question. Uh, we're going to go to uh, Mr. Issa. Well, we won't just come back to it. I think we'll stay with it for a moment. Uh, PNC is going to buy, as announced, uh, a, a price, and they're going to buy National City Bank. If they don't have your implicit money, then they must be doing it with their own money. Now, if they do have your implicit support, then that means that, in fact, a little bit like a Goldman Sachs deal, they have the assurances that they have the money to go do a deal, they go do a deal, and then they get the money at closing. Now, you are sitting here today saying you can't reveal, but in fact, if there is an announced deal, either you are going to provide the money or you are not. It is that simple. Now, I appreciate all the confidentiality and all those other statements, but we have a right to know whether or not there is an acquisition that is going to be done with other funds or the U.S. government's funds. So I am going to ask you once again, in light of that, are, is that acquisition going to be done with the pledge that at closing they will be provided the funds they need? Or are they going somewhere else for the funds, as far as you know? Well, Congressman, generically, just please permit me to speak generically. I can be more candid if you will allow me to speak generically. I don't want to speak generically because we have certain acquisitions, Wachovia, uh, obviously, uh, and, and National City Bank. These are banks where both of us are shaking our heads. And, and by the way, I have nothing against the acquiring banks at all. But we are looking at, the, at the, uh, the banks being bought and saying, if they got the, well, in the case of National City Bank, if we bought $5.5 billion worth of preferred stock in that company, would they be viable? Do you have any knowledge on that to answer that question? The regulators, <clears throat> Congressman, are making judgments on which banks they deem to be healthy banks, viable banks, and making recommendations to us. If a regulator determines that one of its regulated banks is not viable and they do not submit their application to us, then we can't invest in them. It wouldn't be prudent. Okay, so you're basically following the FDIC's lead. Is that right? Well, in this case, well, the, all four banking regulators, the Fed, the FDIC, right. the OCC, and the OTS are the ones who review the initial applications and make the recommendations to Treasury. We then look at those recommendations, either go back for more information or make our own decision. Oh, you said or make your own decision. So you could well, make an independent decision? Absolutely. It's ultimately, it's Treasury's decision on who to invest in and what terms. Okay. So at the end of the day, Hank Paulson gets to decide who lives and who dies, who buys whom. He could potentially have looked and allowed uh, the opposite, the regulators to go in and say to PNC, we don't think you are going to make it, therefore National City Bank is going to buy you out, and $7 billion would have gone the other way. That could have happened. In theory, yes, Congressman. Ultimately, the regulators are the ones who have been supervising these institutions, have people on site, and they are in a much better place to make recommendations to Treasury about who is a healthy bank and who is not. Okay. Well, let's, uh, let's ask the question that I have been wanting to ask. During the, uh, the bailout debate, we had Bill Isaac, a uh, former FDIC chairman, who described to all of us, both sides of the aisle, very bipartisan series of meetings. Uh, as a matter of fact, uh, Mr. Kucinich and I uh, 
Uh, I had never been to a progressive caucus meeting, but I got to go to one because immediately following we had a, a series of, of question and answers with uh, Chairman uh, Bill Isaac. In his time in the Reagan administration, he was granted and used a system of buying subord or subordinated debentures, essentially, with the full in, in, a, in an exchange program that, that put zero dollars, zero dollars of the Federal Government's Treasury money in play because it was a credit default swap, if you will, in its own way, using that. And that authority still exists, still exists today. It requires that the Secretary of the Treasury make a finding, which we have effectively made. We have said there is an emergency. And, in re and then that tool is directly the responsibility of the agency, in this case the FDIC. Why are you said you are using all the tools. Why are you not using that tool instead of, because that tool uniquely says you have got to pay back all the money You're tr to get this increase in your, in your capital base. You are putting your money at risk. Essentially, you are putting your existing stockholders behind these because this is a better stock, if you will, a better debt slash stock. Why are we not using that tool? And isn't that the tool that should be used in this case? Well, Congressman, um, let me say a, a few things. It is an important point. First, the preferred stock that we are buying is senior to the, the common stock. So we get paid back before the equity investors of these institutions. So we are in a better position than their shareholders. And that is very important, number one. Number two, and I don't have all the details on the gentleman's proposal, but I know that some of those proposals, which didn't require any cash going into these institutions, were basically a form of forbearance, pretending that the, that the banks had more capital than they had. We need our banks raising real capital from the private sector also now from the public sector, and recognizing their losses, not pretending that they have more capital than they do. And so we just have to be very careful. There were a lot of ideas tried in the 80s that pretended that we had more capital when we didn't, and it didn't work out very well. Well, first of all, the, you know, the, and, and I know my time is up, but uh, we are pretending we have more capital than we have, because simply moving uh, negative net worth from a bank to the American people is, in fact, causing the American people to lose real capital. The wealth of our country is, in fact, in this case, being moved on to the taxpayers' roles and off of the bank roles. So let's not kid ourselves. If you overpay, you invest in somebody who otherwise would not be solvent, you by definition, and particularly if they are going to buy other banks that you have determined are not solvent, you have determined, in fact, that you are going to spend the American people's money in debt the American people in return for that. So when you chose one instrument over another, as far as I can see here today, what you have done is you have made a determination that you are going to put real money of the American taxpayers' dollars into these banks forever. Because if you buy too cheap, you are giving them real money forever instead of the alternate authority that already existed that we argued should have been used first, where you at least made sure that 100 cents on the dollar, real 100 cents on the dollar, would be fully repaid without any risk to the, the American people except an ultimate liquidation of that entity at a loss. So I appreciate the fact that during the Reagan administration we may have invested in banks that at the time were, although viable going forward, in our opinion, not viable at that moment. The difference was that those banks either became viable and paid back 100 cents on the dollar or everyone lost everything except we got paid first whatever was left. So, you know, I, I appreciate that, but when I asked you the questions earlier about par and where we were and whether we over, overpaid when we invested, you couldn't answer those questions because, in fact, your system puts us at a greater risk as the American taxpayers than the system that we suggested you could do without any authority under the TARP. But, but if I may respond, um, remember there are very important taxpayer protections, not just the dividend rate that we are going to be earning on the preferred stock. The warrants, we are getting 15 percent of the value of the investment in the form of warrants in these institutions. So there are important taxpayer protections that we have designed in so that this ends up being hopefully a good investment for the taxpayers. Right. But this, this is not something we wanted to do. Our first choice is not investing in banks. We felt like we had to stabilize the financial system, and so we have taken bold action to do that. Mr. Uh, Chair, thank you, sir. Uh, the Chair recognizes Mr. Cummings. You may proceed. Mr. Cockus, Kerry, I am still listening carefully. And I'll just, let me ask you a few questions. Um, one of the reasons why I voted for the bailout 
very reluctantly held my nose, closed my eyes, and prayed, um, is because President-elect Obama at that time ha had assured me that if he were elected president, that he would work on making sure that the uh, people that might be losing their houses through foreclosure would be helped. Uh, if President Obama came to you, so I don't know how long you're going to be around, um, so I, I mean, I assume somebody's going to ask Paulson or somebody this question. But if President-elect Obama came to you and said, give me your best advice as to how I can help, how I can help um, people who are facing foreclosure, um, what would you tell him? Congressman, that's a very important question that I've spent a lot of time thinking about. The best thing I think we can do as a country to help the housing market and avoid foreclosures is to bring mortgage rates down for borrowers so they can refinance into long-term sustainable mortgages that they can afford. And the way to do that, partly what we did was stabilizing Fannie and Freddie was to stabilize mortgage finance. And some of the actions we're looking at trying to get credit flowing again is to bring rates down for our consumers. If we can bring mortgage rates down, as you know, Congressman, the Federal Reserve has been cutting interest rates, but that hasn't led to lower borrowing rates for, for borrowers and consumers because the markets are stuck. And so by trying to fix the markets, we're trying to get that directly to the consumers so they can get into mortgages that they can afford. And that will also support home values to stop this falling knife that we have right now. And so my judgment, I'm being very candid with you, bringing mortgage rates down for borrowers is the best thing we could do to try to help homeowners avoid foreclosure and stabilizing our housing, our housing sector. Now, if, if President-elect Obama asked you to stay on, would you stay on? Well, Congressman, I would be uh, honored if the President-elect wanted me to be part of his team. I'd have to talk to my wife, ultimately. This has been a hard two and a half years for her. The, now, you know, we, we have a very volatile, um, let me go back to Fannie Mae and Freddie. Please. I would asked you before a little bit earlier about um, how this loss this announcement on Monday, the $29 billion loss, affects, if at all, what you are trying to do to help the homeowner through Fannie Mae. Do, I mean, does it affect it? Well, <clears throat> excuse me, sir, not directly. We had, when we t t took our actions in July and August to stabilize Fannie and Freddie, we expected big losses to come. And so we sized these $100 billion contracts to be big enough to deal with those losses. So we're not surprised by it. Uh, we knew they were coming, and we don't think that that directly affects what we can do with Fannie and Freddie. Now, you know, I was intrigued by Mr. Ice's questions, and, and I want to give you a broader question sort of hooked up with his. You know, you all have to make some tough decisions as to where this $700 billion is going. And the American people, and this is what I hear at the supermarket and at the gas station when I run into my neighbors, they think that there's a whole line of people who are lined up with their hands out. They're looking at GM. They're looking at all these other folks who are saying, government, bail us out. And I want to know two things. One, what goes into the decision making with regard to, you know, the bailing out? I know, I mean, I know you got certain strictures you got to go, go by. And how do you all m try to make sure that whatever ever the objective is, it is it happens. In other words, do you need more authority from us? Because I got to tell you, one of the most disappointing things for me is when we, when you all give the, gave, gave the banks money, and then I read the next day that a lot of the banks were not going to be loaning money. And I understand what you were trying to do, loaning money, and that they were going to use the money to acquire other banks. They, they were going to use the money to, you know, not make the cut cuts that they needed to, to make and all that kind of stuff. So now we face a situation with GM, and a lot of us are saying, you know what, uh, one out of every, every ten jobs is connected with the automobile industry. We don't, we, we, we want to make sure that we don't lose a GM or lose any of our automobile companies because they are so important to our economy. But at the same time, the American people are saying, 
And, and, and we want to make sure that if they got some money that they, they move towards making sure they're energy efficient cars and they're competitive and all that. So how do you all, you know, say, okay, we're going to give, like Mr. Eisen was saying, you're going to give to this company, you're going to give to this bank, how are you going to do that? And, and so what is the objective and how do you make sure the, the, the objective is, is achieved? In other words, you can't guarantee, but create the best possible circumstance to, to have it achieved. And do you need more authority from us to achieve that? Because I'm going to tell you, the American people are running out of patience. And, you know, my friends, Mr. Issa and Mr. Kucinich, voted against the legislation. I'm going to tell you, I, I ventured to guess most of us wanted to vote against it, even the ones that voted for it. So I'm trying to figure out how do you tell me, how do you do that? You follow me? Because at, so. at some point, the Congress is going to say, sorry, no more. Because you know what? The American people are saying it already. So, Congressman, these are very good questions, and let's talk through them. I, I appreciate you asking them. First of all, if you look at the capital program, we want to make sure our banks are lending in our communities. So we designed in very specific contractual requirements to make sure that happens. Let me walk you through them. One, no dividend increases. Number two, restricting share repurchases. It doesn't make sense for us to put capital in and then have them pay it out to their shareholders. So now that capital is in the bank, if they don't put that money to work, their own returns are going to come down. And so there are very strong economic incentives to make them want to lend. Having said that, it's not going to happen overnight because there's still a lack of confidence in our economy and in our system. And so we believe that the economic incentives are there and are very strong to get them lending in our communities. And the actions that the banking regulators are now taking as their supervisors are, going to, are completely consistent with that objective and are going to be pushing the banks to lend, number one. Number two, I'll be candid with you, many, my phone is ringing off the hook. Many people around the country, individuals, businesses, local and state leaders are calling saying we need help. Our community is in trouble, our business is in trouble, can you help us? If we went out, I will first say, that's exactly why we're taking the actions we're taking. If we went out to each of the people and each of the businesses and communities and helped them directly, the $700 billion wouldn't go far enough. So we're trying to take the $700 billion to stabilize the system as a whole so that credit can then flow out to everybody around the country who needs it. And so it's very hard. We're trying to think of every day, if we have finite resources, how do we use those resources to the best possible benefit to the system as a whole? Because that will help every American. And it's not perfect, and it's not going to happen overnight, but that's our objective. My time is up. I, I thank the gentleman. Uh, we're going to um, uh, go to Mr. Bilbray, and then we are going to have a third round of questioning for Mr. Kashkari. Mr. Kashkari, um, as late as September 5th, the Secretary said that Freddie and Fannie were basically sound and encouraged Americans to purchase shares and invest in those two, um, two identities. These investments were wiped out and um, when the Secretary took over the GSEs. It appears to any reasonable person that the Secretary misled the public on September 5th. Is there, is there any justification for how the Secretary could have made such a terrible mistake that impacted a whole lot of people that trust the word of their government um, when it came down to um, putting their hard-earned resources into these two identities and then watch it evaporate when the same secretary took over control? <clears throat> well, Congressman, first of all, Treasury is not the regulator, as you know, sir, of Fannie and Freddie. Uh, the OFAO and now FHFA is, and they've been releasing reviews of their capital levels and their position. And so any of the Secretary's comments, I think, were based on uh, the regulatory supervision and the analysis that's been done by the regulators, number one. Uh, number two, to my knowledge, I don't think the Secretary ever encouraged people to buy preferred stock in Fannie or Freddie or buy Fannie or Freddie shares. But he did, did, did make the statement 
that, that both of them were sound? Again, sir, I believe it was based on the analysis done in terms of the regulatory capital levels established by the Congress and looking at that analysis. I don't think anybody was more disappointed than he was or we at the Treasury were that we had to intervene to stabilize these institutions or risk systemic risk across the world. You know, there are $5 trillion, as you know, sir, of debt and mortgage-backed securities around the world. Uh, if they had been allowed to collapse, it would have been disastrous for our economy and our financial system. And so we had to take action to step in. And once the decision was made to step in, it was our highest priority was stabilizing the situation, and a close second was protecting the taxpayers as much as possible. And so when we went in, when the regulator went in and put them into conservatorship with the support of the Secretary and the Chairman of the Federal Reserve, the taxpayers received some protections. Warrants for 79.9 percent of the company, you know, dividends on the preferred stock, et cetera. So this is not action any of us wanted to have to take. You know, government action can have unintended consequences. As you know, Fannie Mae was created 80 years ago uh, in the Great Depression. I don't think anybody could have predicted that it would grow to become a systemic risk for the entire country, but it did and we had to take action. We did in 04 and 05 that issue was raised. I remember Ed Royce was raising the issue. They had gone from 30 to 70 percent. Wasn't that kind of an indication that things were growing a little larger than anybody had predicted? I, I, think, I think you're right, Congressman. There were members of Congress and I think members of the administration before my time have been very focused on the systemic risk posed by Fannie and Freddie. And it was unfortunate that it came to what it came to, that we had to take this action. And now Congress and the next administration and the American people will have a very important debate about what form they should take in the long term. So what you're saying is the Secretary basically had no clue that this that um, both of these institutions were on the verge of falling off a cliff? Well, in July, I believe, he came to the Congress. I don't have my dates exactly right. I believe it was July he came to the Congress to ask for specific authority to try to support Fannie and Freddie in the event that they ran into trouble. Again, markets, I've said this a few times, not in this hearing, the one constant throughout the credit crisis has been its unpredictability. Fannie and Freddie's deterioration surprised even us just as the credit market's deterioration surprised us in o September and October. Is the administration ready to go back, let's shift over and go back and now tighten up and the enforcement of the RICO provision on who and where people get loans in this country? Are we willing to say now that, look, we want to make sure that the people that are getting the loans are actually legal under the system and have a viable ID before they, they get that loan? <coughs> Congressman, with deep respect, I'm. I'm not deep in the policy process on that specific issue in, that you're referring to. I know it's an important issue. I know we are passionate about making sure that we issue mortgages that people can actually afford so we don't get back here again, but I'm not deep into that policy piece. Well, Mr. Chairman, I just think we need to understand that this administration, more than any other administration, has specifically told lending institutions that they do not have to follow a guideline that every previous administration has followed to stop the racketeering and especially in California and along the border region where we have huge amounts of assets being laundered by drug cartels, to sit there and say that we are not going to enforce RICO for certain institutions, I think that that's opened up a lot of problems, not just RICO, but I think a lot with this. But now is the time that the American people want to see us go back and reform and change our operational pattern to avoid future problems. And I just hope the administration is brave enough to be able to say, we made a mistake here, we are going to send the signal now that what we said in 05 and 06 is not going to be the rule from now on. And I hope the new administration does it. But I think this administration ought to do the change before the new administration because it is this administration that set the pattern that has created this problem. And I hope you understand mistakes are made, correct it, before the new administration comes along. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, we are going to go to third round of questioning and uh, final round of questioning for Mr. Kashkari. And then we'll go to the next panel afterwards. I thank you for your presence here and for uh, your willingness to submit the questions. National City Bank, are, are you do you are you concerned that you know when you pick winners and losers that you're increasing market concentration that may work against the interest of consumers and in other industries? Do you are you concerned about that? Well, Congressman, we. We are not actively trying to consolidate the industry. But but do you talk to regulators? Do the regulators say it's okay to concentrate in markets? The regulators, I think, will say if you have a failing institution that gets taken over by a healthy institution, that community is better yeah, off. Uh, not. Um, okay. Uh, I, I want to go on to another question. 
Um, by my calculation, out of the first top tranche of uh, 350 billion, 250 has already been spent or pledged, and uh, you have another 40 for further aid to AIG, uh, remaining 60 for new capital uh, purchase plan for non-bank financial institutions. Is it fair to say you've already committed the entirety of the first tranche of 350, 350 billion? I don't think the, the last 60, uh, Congressman, has not been committed. And, and n none of the commitment was for the purchase of mortgage-related asset or conditioned on the uh, recipients of the TARP funds undertaking any mortgage modification. Is that correct? Uh, not contractually. Uh, do you anticipate Congress is going to receive a request in 65 remaining days of this President's administration for Treasury to get access to the second tranche? Uh, the Secretary has not made any determination on when he would uh, make such a request. You know, one of the things that strikes me in your testimony is your view that private efforts <clears throat> up to and including the Hope Now Streamline mod modification are sufficient to stem the foreclosure crisis. You know, it's, it's kind of interesting because we kind of started there. We started with the private sector. We ended up with subprime loans. We started with the private sector and we ended up with, you know, $684 trillion in derivatives. And we got people losing their homes. And then we came up with the TARP, which was going to interfere in the marketplace, but promising us that it's going to uh, help homeowners. And now we've reversed the course and we're saying again it's going to be private efforts, loan modification with regulation. It's kind of like we're back to the future. Now, you're, you're still saying this. Now it's private efforts. Um, mortgage money is going to go to borrowers. You're going to stabilize mortgage rates and people are going to be able to protect their homes. But at the Financial Services Committee hearing on Tuesday, it became clear that the efforts by the private sector to remedy the problems, even efforts coordinated by federal agencies, were insufficient. As our hearing witness, Thomas Deutsch, stated two days ago at the Financial Services Committee, macroeconomic forces bearing down an already troubled housing market are simply too strong for the private sector loan modification initiatives alone to counteract the nationwide increase in mortgage defaults and foreclosures. It's unquote. Now, Mr. Kashkari, why do you have more confidence in the ability of the servicing industry to avoid a tsunami of foreclosures than these observers and, in fact, than the servicing industry has in itself? Could you explain to us? Well, Congressman, uh, again, if you look at the data on what's been achieved, you know, increasing modifications from 23,000 a month to 100,000 a month over the course of the past year, over 200,000 Americans are getting a form of loan workout every month. It's not enough, but a lot of progress has been made. I would also very respectfully ask you to consider the incentives of some folks who are making these plans. You know, there are some folks who would like nothing more than the government to provide guarantees for mortgage-backed securities. The investors would love that. The investors around the world would love it if the U.S. government guaranteed all their mortgage-backed securities under the rubric of helping homeowners. Well, if it gave loan modification and directed uh, lowering principal and interest rates and extending the terms of payments, uh, maybe millions of homeowners would love it. I don't know if you've thought of that, though. Can you point to anything in your hope now or any other private initiative that cures the problems of large proportions of negative equity many borrowers face now that the housing bubble is deflating? <clears throat> negative equity is a very tough tough problem, Congressman. The Hope for Homeowners bill that was passed by this Congress and signed by the President is directed spe specifically at that problem to encourage servicers to take write-downs to get them into mortgages that homeowners can afford with positive equity. I've been informed by staff there's only been 42 workouts. Just thought I'd talk about a box score here. Um, I've got a minute left. And in that uh, final minute, I just want to uh, uh, apprise the members of the subcommittee about this. I just talked to Mr. Issa ab about this matter. Uh, Ms. We, we, we have uh, many industries that are being looked at here. Um, I'm concerned that with all this attention to finance capital, which has been unregulated, we're seeing our industrial capital crushed here. And we're seeing our industrial base threatened by credit freezes. In Cleveland, for example, we have a steel mill that's on idle because orders have dropped because there's a credit freeze. And we have a credit freeze going on where consumers can't get auto loans. So you have people getting laid off in the auto industry. Uh, America's national security is at risk. 
So this subcommittee is going to hold a hearing next Thursday on this specific issue. And we're going to ask people, uh, I, I understand your time availability, but we're going to ask somebody uh, from Treasury to be present to also discuss about uh, what Treasury's plans are, if any, to deal with the fact that we have uh, an industrial base that's in imminent peril. Uh, you know, we're, when, when Mr. Cummings uh, said uh, earlier in questioning and his comments are well taken because you know, when we go back home, people are asking, well, what are you doing for, to keep us in our homes? What are you doing to help protect jobs? We have a whole way of life that's threatened in America. And uh, one thing this subcommittee can do is to require people to come forward and answer questions and try to use that information that we gain to suggest uh, new, new initiatives. And I want to thank uh, uh, Mr. Issa for his willingness to pursue that. And so next Thursday, uh, we'll give you the exact time, but we are going to have a hearing on that and, uh, because we're, we're concerned about using the uh, assets, that the federal assets that the federal government has to protect an entire way of life. Um, I just wanted to make that uh, comment as, as the chair. Uh, we're now going to uh, go to Mr. Issa for uh, a continuation of final round with Mr. Kashkari. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And, and I'll, I'll be brief. I don't think I'll use the whole uh, five minutes. Uh, I don't know if you are aware, but later today I'll be forming the, uh, the bank of the 49th Congressional District of California. I'll be looking for 10 or $15 billion, and I, and I hope I'll be favorably received. I have no deficits. I don't have a negative net worth. And the viability of the real estate in California, if anything, has never been better because it's never been uh, lower than it is today. So uh, hopefully someone from your staff will help my staff run through the application for a federal charter so we can, we can end this question of, of, of how we get money to creditworthy banks. Uh, certainly, if National City Bank uh, wasn't credit worthy and, and needed to go away, I'm shocked that uh, PNC would pay $5.5 billion for a company that was insolvent. Uh, that, that becomes one of the, the conundrums I find is if, if somebody isn't worth investing in by the American people, but they're worth, when you invest in somebody else, buying out for $5.5 billion, then my years in business were, were misspent, I guess. Uh, let me. Uh, let me go into two questions. One, earlier in your testimony, and, and I know you're the messenger and, and, and you've been, you're, you're bullet ridden at the end of this hearing, so I'll, I'll try to make these last two a little more at the economics level, a little less at the, uh, uh, the level of why didn't you do what we asked you to do kind of level. You said earlier that if you just bought mortgages, you'd run out of money, and that essentially what you're saying is you need to leverage it more. I don't have a problem with that concept, but let me go through a hypothetical for you real quickly because I'd like to make sure it goes back to Treasury with you. If you had taken $50 billion and you'd put it into a fund and said this fund exists for bank, banks of exclusive refinance, meaning we'll go to anybody where there's a deep discount for the existing homeowner to refinance his home the bank that's walking away has to agree to be wiped out. But in return, they will get 100 percent of the current market for that product. The homeowner puts in whatever skin they can and refinances. You then take that refinance package, understanding that the banks lost nothing because they were going to foreclose and they were only going to get market anyway. You've got a willing buyer to, in a sense of a refi. If those packages were packaged up, do you believe, or let me rephrase that, do you believe for a minute that you wouldn't be able to resell those packages and thus have that $50 billion be leveraged 10 or 15 or 20 times? Because every time you get $50 billion worth of these new packages and sell them on the market, you've got your $50 billion again, the way originally subprime was done. And let's assume for a moment there's a small equity factor in there, in other words, a certain amount so that you don't get it all back. Do you believe for a minute you wouldn't be able to repackage those and leverage that 50 or 350 or 700 billion in order to get people to stay in their homes if they're able to make a mortgage at current value? And <clears throat> Congressman, let me, to make sure that I followed it and I got it right and I'm reacting to what I think I am, let me just repeat it back to you. So if we bought mortgages and repackaged them and sold them, 
that would be a way of leveraging the TARP funds. Is that just to keep it really simple? Essentially, yes. Yeah, essentially, yes. So because when it was presented to us, it was we're going to do it one time originally. Right. And my only question to you is, yep. was that considered? It was, and I'll walk you through okay. it. Um, <clears throat> that's but a lot of the then work. Then why that, isn't it being done? That's a lot of the work that we're doing in uh, to reach to where we are in, in looking at that, the idea of buying loans, modifying them, repackaging them to free up more space under the TARP. The challenge is, as we found, is it's a very slow process. A few months, it turns out, to acquire, let's say, $50 billion worth okay. of mortgages. Okay, I'll stop you because I want to be respectful of the time. I'm not talking about the loans. I'm talking about the houses. They're new loans. Whoever is foreclosing on, on Mr. Kucinich okay. or my uh, constituents, who's ever foreclosing, is offered uh, by the owner based on having gone to the bank of the 49th Congressional District or the Ohio Bank uh, of, of Reconsolidation, they, they say, look, I've got, I've got a, a short sale effectively financed with, with this. This group is a willing buyer, willing seller situation. The homeowner is willing to put their name on the line, presumably a recourse loan, presumably a fresh, but it's at a lower rate. It's a short sale, but it's a short sale to the person that's in the house at current market price. Why wouldn't that system leverage the American taxpayers' dollars almost infinitely because we're forcing the banks to recognize the real mark to market, but we're creating a market for the resale of that, of that asset immediately so it provides the real liquidity. If your program to prop up the banks afterwards is still needed, that's fine. But why is it we're not doing something like that with this huge amount of money that we gave you almost unlimited ability to use in different ways? And again, just to be clear, I want to make sure I'm answering the right question. So the TARP would be providing the loan to the buyer at the, at the current market price in the short sale? It would be buying the, it, it would undoubtedly use a, a bank or some other entity. Uh, but it would be TARP funds going to the It would be homeowner. TARP funds. Okay. And then we would package those up and sell and them. And they get immediately resold because they are not, they're not corrosive loans. Right, they are not right, any right. of this other stuff. They they're at the real market today. Uh, perhaps even Got with it. a federal guarantee in case things go lower. Why is it we are not doing that so we can get the leverage that the gentleman to my left so desperately want? Right. Well, Congressman, at least my preliminary, as just as we have talked about it, that sounds an awful lot like the Hope for Homeowners program where what ends up happening is the borrower gets put into a new loan that he can afford at today's market price for the house and then those loans are securitized and sold off through Ginnie Mae. And the challenge is, there are very complex incentives on the existing lender's willingness to mark down that loan into that loan that that homeowner can now afford based on today's market okay. price. So I, basically, I, I'm going to cut you off because my time has been cut off uh, appropriately. Uh, I think what your problem is is as long as you give the money to the banks without their fully availing themselves, what happens is you're discouraging that secondary behavior uh, because you're putting the money into their their back pocket. And, and causing them not to be desperate enough to, to use that other program. I'm going to close with one question I want back for the record real quickly. Currently, today, Treasury bills uh, at two years are 1.22 percent, GSEs are 2.64 percent, five years, 2.3 percent versus 2.65, 10 years, 3.72 versus 5.08. Why has Treasury not, with their full faith guarantee of GSE, not insisted, in fact, that they be T-bills? Why is it today the American taxpayer is funding Fannie and Freddie at a rate, a cost of money rate, that is substantially higher to the American taxpayer because of what we did in taking it over without getting T-bill rates? Had you converted GSEs to T-bills, you would have been able to get these rates. I would like an answer for the record. Of course, sir. Um, first of all, we do not, Fannie and Freddie are not full faith and credit. We have provided very strong implicit support through these contracts that provides the Treasury's backing, but they are not the same thing as saying it is full faith and credit. It is darn close, but it is not quite full faith and credit, number one. Number two. Um, it is not very close on the interest rate, well, I am afraid. But, but number two, the Treasury lending authority, if we wanted to provide all the lending to them instead of them going to the market themselves, the Congress provided us authority to the end of 2009. So we want, we need Fannie and Freddie to be able to access the markets directly for their long-term obligations to continue to fund themselves. And so we could step in on a short-term basis and provide liquidity, but not, uh, it's not an unlimited authority. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I thank Mr. Issa for the uh, final round of questioning. Mr. Kashkari, uh, Chair recognizes Congressman Cummings. You may proceed. Um, Mr. Kashkari, um, 
in the neighborhood I grew up in, in the inner city of Baltimore, one of the things that you tried to do was make sure that you were not considered a chump. And what chump meant was that you didn't want to see want people to see you as just somebody they could get over on. And I'm just wondering how you feel about an AIG giving five hundred and three million dollars worth of bonuses out of one hand and accepting a hundred and fifty four billion from hard working taxpayers. I, you know, because I'm trying to get I'm trying to make sure you get it. You know? I mean and you know what what really bothers me? Is because all these other people who are lined up, they say, well, is Kashkari a chump? We can just go in there, and I'm not saying they are. I don't know. We can go in there, we'll get some money, and you know what AIG did? They even will tell you they're coming back for some more. And they have the nerve, the nerve, to grant some $503 million worth of bonuses. I'm just wondering, do you all say, say to yourself, boy, this doesn't look too good. And I'm wondering about them, if it was strictly from a PR standpoint. And I know nothing about PR, but one thing I do know, I wouldn't want to be asking my friend for uh, some money to help me stay afloat. And if I didn't get the money, I'd be out of business. And then for my friend, I say, okay, I'm, I'm really struggling. Then my friend, who can barely afford to go to McDonald's, then walks around and sees me in a restaurant costing $150 a meal. There's absolutely something wrong with that picture. And so I wonder, do you all, I mean, do, does that go through your head? Or is it just me? Am I missing something? No, no Congressman, you know, I share your, I saw the same images that you saw of the parties, and I share your frustration with that. We, what about the $503 million dollars worth of bonuses? Let's, let's talk about that, because I heard about that this morning, I think as you did, in the paper. And I asked my colleagues to check on it and say, what is this? Because I was outraged when I saw the headlines. What was explained to me is that this was money, apparently, and I'm not defending it, but this is money that had already been paid to uh, employees that was set aside in a separate fund that they would get if they left AIG. And we need AIG to keep running as a company so that it can sell off its assets and pay back the taxpayers. And so from what's been explained to me is that this money that had already been paid but set aside to the employees was now released so that the employees did not have an incentive to quit because we need them to keep working so that they can sell off the assets and pay back the taxpayers. We, need them, to to me. Yeah. we need them to keep working, but guess what? There are a whole lot of people that can replace them because there are so many people losing their jobs. This is an employer's market today. That's true, sir. Come on now. No, I, I'm there are you, people, I, gu I guarantee you, there are people who are lined up saying, please quit so I can get a job. And that's what the American people are looking at, and they are frustrated. Now, let me go to another question. You said something very interesting. And by the way, I, 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 I thank you. You have a tough job. The 350 billion that's left, you said that Mr. Paulson has not made a decision on that. And, and, and I mean, I don't want to be considered a chump either. You cannot convince me that Paulson is not coming back for the 300. I know you say he hasn't made a decision, that he's not coming back for the 350 billion because you've said here several times that you that the 700 billion, you know, if you don't do it this way, do that, do it that way, you won't be able to. You can't achieve but so much. So you, obviously, you need that. I mean, what would be the logical argument to get the 350 billion if you were advising Mr. Paulson to go after the 350 billion? It, it would be the the priorities that he's outlined. So number one, additional capital for all sorts of financial institutions, not just banks, because many of them provide credit to our communities. Number two, getting consumer credit flowing again. I talked about auto loans, 
credit cards, student loans, et cetera. Those markets are frozen today. And so to get at those problems, that's, what, that's part of what we'd want to use the second 354 if he makes that determination. So that's what I would be talking to him about, sir. Well, you would, so last but not least, a lot of times when we have these hearings, and I'll close with this, and I walk away from the hearing, I, I often ask myself, does the witness, I mean, does the witness then go to his friends and his employees and say, Phew, we got through that one, and then go back to business as usual. I am praying that, and I am, and I'm, I'm talking about constituents, man. I'm, I mean, I'm talking about people who are hurting. I am praying that you will never be the same after this hearing. I'm serious, and I know that you've been reaching out, trying to do it, but in other, words, in other words, I want you to go back with a little bit more fire. I'm not saying you haven't had the fire, but I want it to be hotter to try to help these people who are losing out. These are the people that I face. See, I, I go home every night. I live in Baltimore, so I see my constituents every day. And so I need, they need help, and they're begging for help. And I just hope that when you go back, you don't say, got past Kucinich, got past Ice and Cummings, it's a little rough. But okay, boys, let's go back to business as usual. We can't afford it. And nor can we afford to be chumps. We can't afford it. It is too much. People are hurting and they are in pain. And so I hope that when, while we're looking at Wall Street and we're looking at all the folks that's got their hands out, and we're looking at all the AIG officials as they go on their little junkets and whatever, that you keep in mind, and I know you've been doing it, but I want you to do it even more, that every decision that you make, you think about those folks who are losing their jobs and who are in pain and who are not going to have a decent Christmas. They're going to probably be sitting under the Christmas tree with no presents. You know why? Because they won't have a job. And all of these people, and I hope that as they come to you begging for the, the taxpayers' money, that you'll remind them of all the people who are suffering and that are in pain, and tell them that it cannot be business as usual. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Cummings. Uh, Mr. Kashkari, do you have any response? Thank you for the opportunity to be here today. Uh, just to Mr. Cummings, uh, I don't know how to work any harder than we're already working. And I, I take your feedback very seriously. That's why we're working as hard as we are, and we're just going to keep doing and trying to accomplish and meet your expectations. Thank you very much. If, if I uh, may uh, uh, take the prerogative as chair to say, I don't think anyone questions, Mr. Kashkari, that you're working hard. Our question is who you're working for. Um, that will conclude this first panel. I want to thank you for your presence here. Uh, as Mr. Cummings said, I know that uh, it's, uh, it, it cannot have been easy. Uh, you've been a answering questions for over two hours. And uh, the committee will take note that uh, you have um, engaged in a uh, thoughtful Q&A here. So we appreciate it. Just want you to know it's much appreciated. Thanks. And we understand the burdens of your office. So uh, we're going to uh, thank Mr. Kashkari for his presence here. And we're going to move on to the second panel. I would ask the uh, witnesses from the second panel to uh, come to the committee table. And thank you again, Mr. Kashkari, for your presence here. The committee will take a, a, a five-minute recess while the uh, table is set up for the second panel. Testing, testing, testing.
This House Oversight uh, Subcommittee, the Policy Subcommittee, taking a, a break after two hours of testimony by Neil Kashkari on how the Treasury Department is spending part of that $700 billion rescue plan. Another panel getting set up, as you heard the chairman mention, they'll take a five-minute break here uh, until they get, get going with the, the second panel. Regarding that uh, financial rescue, the Associated Press reports today that three big city mayors are asking the federal government to use a portion of that money, that $700 billion, to assist struggling cities. Those would be the mayors of Philadelphia, Shirley Franklin of Atlanta, and Phil Gordon of Phoenix. And in a related economic story, the FDIC is, says it's planning to uh, help homeowners keep 1.5 million homes. They're proposing a $24 billion government funding plan be used to help 1.5 million households to avoid foreclosure. The FDIC posted the plan today on the website two days after Treasury Secretary Paulson rejected the idea of using money from the $700 billion plan. And here in Washington today on this Friday, world leaders arriving for the uh, economic summit this weekend at the White House. A number of world leaders coming to Washington. They will meet beginning this evening at the White House. We'll have some uh, live coverage of that as the arrivals begin this evening at about 6 Eastern here on C-SPAN.